Sazen.
Welcome to our evening practice, the evening talk. Welcome to all those on Zoom. Thank you for joining us this evening. The, uh, the entirety of my talk refers to two words uh, on this. This is the, the end of the, first, of the second full day of our session. And the two words that we've been exploring outside of words directly are being time, being time. We say a lot of words to point to what is not experienced in words, what's outside of words, which is direct, a direct experience, personal, intimate experience. We've been, um, we've been talking up Dogen's teaching on how all being is time. Uh, how all being is time. And hopefully this, this concept and these words, these pointing words, uh, will, in the course of, it, of um, exploring, will really open up a part of your own experience in a way that is freeing. Because that's, after all, what we're, what we're doing here. We're looking into how do we limit our freedom? How do we limit our capacity to offer our gifts, to enjoy our own gifts in our life, and to offer our gifts to others and to all of life? So in this fascicle uh, that suggested this way of um, organizing our Rohatsu Sashin, um, the fascicle on being time is titled U Uji. And it's how all being is time. Being and time coincide. Being time is experienced in the breath, in the breath, this breath, every breath, in the very time that we are being. This seems really self-evident. So why does it matter enough to really take such an intensive look into it? Well, that's for each of us to discover for ourselves. So being time is experienced in the breath, and you must grow quiet. You must grow quiet to hear with the heart, the voice of natural breath, the voice of nature, to listen to the breathing beneath the breathing, the earth breathing to know the profound, subtle radiance of this life awake and the very nature of suffering and how to release, how to be released from suffering, how to release suffering because in a certain way we hold on to it. It's our holding on that is part and parcel of suffering. In the uh, gata on opening the sutra, which is what we chant uh, usually before a dharma talk, there's this line, the dharma incomparably profound and minutely subtle, infinitely subtle. Uh, most of you have heard me talk about this line before because it's, it is, it's so inspiring. It always brings me back to paying very, very close in attention. Minutely, in, 
infinitely. Those words, minute, infinite, they elicit both time and space uh, as they converge in our mind. So notice, notice how it affects you in your own mind when you hear the word minute, infinite. All words offered during this being time are pointing out. They point out, words point out. They do, that's, what, that's how they function. The direct content that we experience that makes up our life is pointed to with the words we use. We usually notice and remark on time passing and emphasize when we do passing rather than time itself. What's, what's, um, what is passing? What is alive? What is alive right now in awareness? Right now. And for the time being, we drop deeply into this particular inquiry into time, which is rarely explored so fully. And because it's elusive, it's not a thing, there's no materiality to it. It is so all pervasive in our experience, in our ordinary experience of happiness and suffering. And we don't, we, we explore time um, because it is so subtle. And as we develop in our practice, we become attuned to ever more subtle aspects of experience. In Zen practice, we become ever more aware of each ingredient in how experience of being a self is composed. Like a cake. In a cake, the first ingredient is flour, which is the physical basis. And then the rest of the ingredients contribute to the look, the flavor, the texture of the cake. Eggs add structure and stability within a batter and are an important part of the texture. Sugar or honey adds sweetness and lets us know that this is dessert that follows the serious food, the savory meal. This is all metaphor, of course, for our, for our life, right? And it's also true of the cake. <laughs> Salt enhances the flavor of the other ingredients in the cake. Chocolate adds a specific flavor and color, as would in a different kind of cake, the lemon or spices. Then there's also baking powder, which helps the cake become light and fluffy. It's kind of like humor in our Zen or um, Loving kindness practice adds space and lightness. Likewise, all of our experience is composed, is constituted by conditions mixed into, uh, into uh, with the many f uh, features of our experience. So we could look at our life as always occurring within a time reference, what's cooking right now? What ingredients are being combined and doing their thing? Time is kind of like the flower of the cake. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's a basic ingredient in our in experience, in our body-mind life. 
we have an elaborate vocabulary around time. And if we were to stop using any reference to time, we wouldn't be able to describe anything. When I was uh, talking about that I was going to give a talk about time, a friend of mine who's a poet just laughed and said, oh my goodness, what would we do without the words for time? How would we ever manage? And uh, as a poet, she went right to how this is a basic ingredient in every experience that we, that we order. It's the basic order, ordering. We'd never be able to describe anything. Events are structured in time sequences, like a cake is structured around flour. And we bake it for a half hour at 375 degrees. Or living out your day without the time ingredient, either included in the words you use or else much more subtly. Time infuses energy variously throughout the experience of a day and night through all of our activities and stillness as we discover, perhaps sometimes painfully in the Zendo during the Sashin. What comes before, what comes after? How easy, how difficult, how stressful under the pressure of deadlines it is for us. Have you ever thought of the word deadline? <laughs> it had never occurred to me to consider that word deadline. We're all in life. We all have a deadline, don't we? <laughs> Undisclosed. All the more reason to wake up. Don't put it off. We don't know when our deadline is. So, um, so we can um, we can spend our our life resisting or very very caught up in the pressures of all the uh, deadlines that we have in our usual life. And then when we get to Sashin, it's really hard to relinquish the pressure, even though we might hate it and complain of it during when we're not at Sashin. When we get to Sashin, first we have this experience of relief. Oh, phew, I can just relax and be. And then the resistance starts coming up. Because facing the openness and the spaciousness can be very daunting. We don't spend a lot of time relaxed enough with the raw material of this very being time moment to trust it. So that so Sashin so is always a huge infusion or a huge challenge to our basic sense of trust, trusting our own experience. Everything's all right. Especially when we don't know. That's when it's really, that's really challenging. We don't know what we are going to encounter when we no longer have the, the clock ticking in the usual ways. And we let go of before and after and all of the all of our uh, our um, emphasis together is on right now. So before and after isn't so relevant during Sashim. So we've been chanting uh, the Genjo Koan, the Koan of everyday life. And um, here here's um, part of it. Firewood turns into ash and does not turn into firewood again, but do not suppose that the ash is after and the firewood is before. 
We must realize that the firewood is in the state of being firewood and has its before and after. So this can be uh, really confusing. Um, in our usual uh, in our usual way, boy, I had a note here in my notes. I'm gonna take a look. Give me a minute. Um, oh, it's okay. So, um, so this this verse that we chant every day during Sashin can be really puzzling and uh, from the standpoint of the ordinary way we think about things, our usual uh, life is mapped on before and after, next and was, right? <laughs> Coming up and was yesterday. Uh, before and after is such a constant kind of absolute in which we order our perceptions and our version of what happens or what happened. Usually, Usually we schedule, we anticipate, we remember. A sense of before and after is so embedded in our ordinary narrative that we don't even notice. But these lines of the Genjo Koan are turning our attention. And uh, of course, Genjo Koan is also by Dogen, who, who wrote the uh, Uji on being time. So these lines turn our attention to the fundamental or original basis of momentary experience. Before and after, before and after, what lies before, what lies in the middle of before and after? That's where we are focusing right now. So one thing that I, I really wanted to mention too is this puzzlement, because I was so I was for a while quite puzzled by those lines, the way he he doesn't uh, he doesn't regard for before and after in the same way that I was used to doing, and being puzzled, uh, it, it's it's one of the reasons we read Dogen is to feel puzzled. One of his his great contributions to teaching Zen is to puzzle us because the only what you do when you are puzzled is you stop and you don't know and your usual mind can't figure it out and so we're driven even more urgently into well, what do what do <laughs> i what do i know of this right he's a real genius as far as that goes puzzling us so appreciate it and don't avoid Dogen because you're puzzled. Just say, oh yes, great. Now I have a chance here to really see into my, <laughs> all the things that really give me a hard time. Um, so uh, now to get back to these lines, firewood becoming ash is ordinarily how we think that the process goes in the fireplace or the fire pit. Firewood becomes ash. But from the standpoint of the absolute, each takes its own Dharma position. That's that's a term he uses in this in this book. In other words, each thing has its own place and time. Firewood is in the state of being firewood and has its before and after. Just so. Yet having this before and after is independent of them. And the same goes for ash. Firewood and ash are independent and connected, relative and absolute. Along the line of, of time. This subtle understanding of how to view ordinary time has a lot of implications for suffering and ending our suffering. When we identify an experience and generalize from it, we cancel out the life of all those aspects that we don't that we're not noticing. 
if we're identified with depression, we don't notice subtle joy. If we're identified with anger, we don't notice minute kindness. So this whole thing about time, it, it's such a potent ingredient in our suffering. And uh, what came to mind as I was thinking about this talk was a friend of mine who I was very surprised to hear her say she was still angry with her husband about an affair he had at the very early uh, at a very early time in their marriage. Her husband died a number of years ago. She's still angry about that betrayal. And in a way, that refer that that kind of demonstrates how it's helpful to really contemplate how time operates and what our assumptions are about it because in a certain way and Dogen points this out in his uh, fascicle on time being and being time we we approach it as though uh, time stacks up on itself but he makes it very clear that it does not stack up. Um, and if, if we are misunderstanding the nature of time, then we can make a lot of um, unfortunate, uh, these beliefs can lead us to a, a lot of unfortunate suffering that's not benefiting, it's not even real. I mean, in the case of my friend, her husband's dead, for goodness sakes. And after that early um, affair, he was a devoted and loving husband for years. And this is still this, this mistaken idea about time is still keeping her from being whole and joyful at this time of her life, carrying around this, this, um, this heavy burden that's stacked on our heart. And that's really the way to karma works too. We get stacked up with conditions that are long gone. And it's one of the reasons why Zen practice is so potent is because we come to, and today, today in uh, Sanzen, several of you shared that you were having a series of uh, memories of childhood. Um, this is this is how we start to take the stack apart <laughs> and appreciate the the before and after nature, but it's not still going on. So when we realize the Dharma view, <clears throat> Oh yeah, when we when we realize this within within our own heart mind and open our Dharma eye, which is really something, it's a way of saying what the word enlightenment uh, points to. But I prefer opening the Dharma eye because then that eye sometimes closes again, and then it opens again, and then it closes again. It's not a it's not a thing. It's a process, moment by moment. It's a being time artifact. So when we open this, the mind of our heart, the self as experienced is complete in this very time, for now, for the time being. Nothing's outside. Uh, it, it is a being time has no before and after. And maybe some of you have touched this. I mean, a lot of a lot of people present here in the room and on the uh, zoom screen have been practicing a long time. You know this, you know, the, these these uh, moments of just being clear, open, simple, with a great sense of gratitude and 
being deeply moved by the perfection of the moment in some mysterious way. What changes when we taste this? Nothing, <laughs> except our mind, our view. We've gotten a glimpse of something that's always available. As we mature in practice, we become much more subtly attuned to each minute element of our present experience. And this view, uh, which we can only recognize for ourselves, in spite of all the words you hear ta talked about it, it only makes a difference when you realize it for yourself. It's not a concept in the mind. It's not a concept at all. But in our own direct experience, vivid, not separate, nowhere else, just right here, present in this very time as self. This is self right here and now. This, thus, if one practices and realizes this very being time, when one realizes one dharma, one penetrates one dharma. That's part of the, the Genjo Koan. When one encounters one activity, one practices one activity. When riding your bike, washing the dishes, smelling the rain, just being time. Nothing missing, completely alive because the place is right here, nowhere else. And the way leads everywhere. So any kind of taste shines its light broadly in unexpected ways. Any genuine moment of being. The limits of what can be known, says the chant, cannot be known. That's true. Knowing has to do with before and after. So not knowing is the mind of the present moment. There's no before and after. And opening into direct unimpeded experience is what is also termed shanyata or uh, suchness. It's distinct, you can't miss it. And I think I've told some of you this story about when I, I was in Sanzen with Chozen, and um, I was talking about um, uh, some clarity I had or a feeling I had, an experience I had, and uh, I said, I think, I, think I, I think I've awakened. And she said, you think you've awakened? It's like saying, I think I had a baby. <laughs> you can't miss it. <laughs> Outside of time, it's outside of time. Time is irrelevant, infinitely subtle, infinitely subtle, this, this mind that is so present. Uh, all experience of the sacred participates in this timeless quality. Uh, this timeless quality is sometimes also called divine light or the glorious golden radiance of the infinite, which I think one of you is going to talk about, one of the elders will talk about in their talk. Uh, this timeless quality, the quality of being outside of time, the, the moment where you, you kind of realize for yourself what the word eternal or infinite is referring to, because of this open, empty fixation, empty of fixation, subtle radiance of mind, expansion in all directions. Or rather, limit is beside the point. So when the, uh, at Rohatsu Seshin, we celebrate the Buddha's enlightenment. And when the Buddha looked up in, at the morning star, there was nothing apart there was no time, no Buddha, no star, just independent and complete being time. 
So next time you look up at the morning star or the nighttime Jupiter planet, whatever is really in this part of the sky and very bright, <laughs> if, if it's a clear night, or the moon, really stir deeply. That is, everything stops. It's just that moon. And no self, no thought of self. Self drops away in that way. So here's a modern um, image that expresses realization, same kind of re uh, realization that Buddha had and when he looked at the morning star, but this is much more uh, modern. And many of you know it. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. That's the morning star. So if this were your koan, how would you present it to Dogen? What depends on a red wheelbarrow? How would you express it? So much depends upon, what a wonderful, wonderful. I mean, everybody who knows this poem loves this poem because there's something so central to our, our uh, existential truth in it. So uh, Shinshu, in her essay on Uji, um, writes that instead of being limited to the conventional everyday sense of time as a horizontal line of sequential events that we experience as past, present, and future, in Uji, Dogen is concerned with the non-dual nature of time and being. Now there, that's simple. She's talking about the non-dual. We hear a lot these days about non-dual practice. How can true practice ever be anything but non-dual, actually? And, um, and she goes on to say that this non-dual nature of time and being is expressed in a presencing moment. So when we talk about practicing presencing, we're, we're allowing being time to be the most central, right in the middle of the focus. One reason why we use something as simple as following the breath. Because as long as we're alive, we got that breath. And we always come back to it when we get all com complicated in our mind and our cognitive world. We come back to the breath and this and be and just be a dharma position has a past present and future but it is freed from being defined by past present and future interesting statement huh each moment reveals itself with all its features present this is our very life it's the time of our life Time is not separate from being. Time and being are two sides of one event. The identity of relative and absolute says it this way. Each and all the subjective and objective spheres are related and at the same time independent. Related yet working differently, though each keeps its own place. That's, that's just so simply stated. The relative and absolute, subjective and object, objective. We are never free of subjectivity. I am the subject of the world. I imagine you feel the same way for, about yourself. So. We're never free of that. Any view is a subjective view. What, we, what we're working with here is um, opening, opening up the view to include 
way beyond the I. I, mean, I letter I. A person is empty of a fixed identity. So this is a this is a, a different way of saying identity of relative and absolute. A person is is empty of a fixed identity, yet simultaneously functions as separate, conscious, and familiar. So it is with time. It's experienced as flowing and sequential. There are winter, spring, summer, fall, after all. Of course, it's flowing and sequential. That is the, um, that's the, um, the limited view, the view that's tied to sp the specific conditions that are temporary, impermanent. Um, so that, and also we notice time and its quality of a of flashing in, instantaneity as a complete event. So a flash of lightning or a flickering lamp involves no duration at all. What else involves no duration? Very little, actually. Even the sound of a raindrop on the roof as a duration, very small. So this is the realm of mystery. It's experience, it's this experience of time and timeless that accounts for the magical quality of Sashin. Now the first couple of days of Sashin, it doesn't feel very magical, but by the end, it can be rather magical. <laughs> Odd things happen. Uh, when we interrupt our usual habits of busyness, they go on and on and forward and cultivate stopping, which we've been doing, and everything slows and empties out a bit, becoming more spacious and quiet, then we experience faces of our life that lay hidden within the noise and constant forward motion of our thoughts and our activity and our reactivity. The uh, one thing that's always noticeable is the first few days of Sashin, um, it's very easy to become quite reactive. And as it goes on, it just doesn't seem to happen nearly <laughs> the same oomph that it happened in the, in the beginning. Because our condition has changed considerably, whether we realize it or not. So um, it's a, um, in recognizing the timeless, how do we reckon as ordinary human beings with what is held, uh, what, what holds us in our narrow fixed notion of time. I'd like to share a, a remarkable uh, piece from a book I've been reading on time that elicits a view of time uh, in the original teachings of the Jains, uh, which is a, uh, a sect, they still are around, uh, but they were there at the time of the Buddha. Um, not all cultures have a sense of history, uh, the, kind, the same kind of time sense that we do. And, um, and actually our time sense is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Our sense of history, our ability to remember is getting less and less. That's studied and verifiable. Uh, so I want to read you this, this passage, which is just so, it's archetypal in its imagery, and it's just so filled with amazing things that you probably have never thought before. So this, this, um, this age known as very beautiful, very beautiful, lasted 400 trillion oceans of years and gave way to that known as very beautiful, which, as the name suggests, 
was exactly half as fortunate as the former. The wish fulfilling trees, the earth and the waters were only half as bountiful as before. Men and women were only four miles tall, had only 128 ribs, lived for only two periods of countless years and passed to the world of the gods when their twins were only 64 days old. This period lasted 300 trillion oceans of years, declining gradually but inevitably to the stage called sorrowfully very beautiful, when joy became mixed with grief. The breathing in and out of the universe by Brahma every 4,000 million years is not an image of the future calculated to motivate record keeping, planning and action. Nor has it done so in India. The lack of interest in history in Indian culture has long been complained of by historians who can't locate records because no one bothered to keep them. A supposed Indian lack of interest in the future is also sometimes complained of by development planners. <laughs> I just I just wanted to share that just out of enthusiasm. I don't know that it puts forward this talk in any way, but it's just so remarkable to reflect on how narrowly we are enculturated in relation to our sensibility about time. Um, and from this, oh, somebody commented from this vast perspective history, bounded time, sequential time, in contrast is just one damn thing after another. When we look into our own grief and struggles and sorrow, it's always bounded by one thing after another. One thing piling up on another. But in the absolute outside of time, nothing interferes with another. Even this passage that I read, uh, even a very long time is bounded. It's, it's long, right? It's not being time. Just pointing that out. Um, in the openness of direct presencing, there's nothing to pile up. Each keeps its own place. When we forget and get swallowed up in the particularities of our conditions, as though they are on, the only story we suffer, because we want to make things different from how they are. And it is the wanting, the clinging to what might be, if only, if it wasn't like this. Because we want to make things different. We want to push in some other direction, exert force in some other direction, and we suffer. Forcing arises when we misunderstand the nature of being time or impermanence when we think we can impede or control its passage or transformation. There are so many conditions in the infinite truth of life, of any one of our lives. We can look into how our sense of time is an element in any form of our own suffering. Part of the nature of suffering is time. Restlessness, hostility, torpor, grief, any form of suffering. What's your favorite? Look, look at the time element in it. So this is why we practice. This is why we vow to awaken to the origin of subtle radiance or as Dogen calls it, the glorious golden radiance of the infinite. This radiance 
shines its light through any heart mind that's open, even a teeny, teeny, tiny bit. We can have one little glimpse and it can keep us practicing for years, knowing the possibility of our own consciousness. So we can't see the passage of time as it is, except how it, um, how it is the nature of every moment of our life. So, as we end each evening of our nights at Sashin, I respectfully say to those who wish to be enlightened, do not squander your life by night or day. Do not squander your time. So thanks for being so patient. I know I talked for quite a while, but thank you. And um, good night to those on Zoom. We'll see you tomorrow night, hopefully. Take good care of yourselves and practice well. And um, this is an opportunity for the silver dragons to exam.